Okay, good morning everyone. Um, first of all, I have to thank Richard Mills and the other people from Research Autism for inviting a little unknown shrimp from Belgium to this conference. Um, I'm very honored with the invitation, especially because this is a conference that honors Lorna Wing, so I want to pay my tribute to Lorna first. Um, when I started my career in, in Belgium um, almost 30 years ago, I did not know anything about autism. And they told me, here is a book, read that one and you will understand. And that was the book I had to read, Lorna's book. I didn't actually read that one, I read the Flemish version. <laughs> um, so, as you probably hear, my English is not my uh, mother tongue, so excuse me for any errors if I say stupid things today, blame my language. Um, I will try to do my best, however. Now, during my career, I got, um, I was so lucky, I got to meet three different Lorna's. The first Lorna was the clinician um, who taught me to use the HBS because I started my career diagnosing children with autism. And we used the HBS, now the DISCO, uh, in our diagnosis. So I was very grateful that I had that tool. And um, the second Lorna was the Lorna, the researcher who told me all about the different social subgroups in the spectrum and who told me we have groups for adults at our center that it's not a good idea to put together six adults who are of the aloof type because then you have to drag all day to get something out of them and to have them something do together. On the other hand, don't ever put six active but odd types together as well because you would be crazy after 10 minutes. So that was Lorna, the researcher, who gave me some practical ideas, but it was only in 2010 that I was so lucky to meet Lorna, the mother, because we were presenting together at a conference um, in uh, Sussex in 2010, and we stayed in the same hotel, and, um, and the whole evening Lorna and I were talking, and at that time, 2010, Lorna was mainly talking about Susie, so that was Lorna, the mother, and I think she combined all three of them. Um, in, in this book, indeed, as a scientist and a researcher, she said, we should look for uh, methods for cure and prevention, but as long as we don't find them, we, we should take this important task to help children who are already handicapped to achieve as happy and as full a life as possible for them. And that's what I want to focus on in my uh, contribution to this conference. Now, it's called Jane's View. If I look uh, at, at back at my career and where I want to go in the coming years because I'm not going to stop working yet. Uh, we are obliged in Belgium to go on retirement after 67 now. And by the time I will be 67, it will be probably 75. So I think I will never go on retirement. Um, but in the beginning, I looked at behavior mainly of people with autism rather than how they think. And if I look back at what Francesca Hapé said yesterday, understanding the autistic cognition is actually very important in understanding autism because the criteria we use for diagnosing autism are what I uh, name outside criteria. This is just the outside of autism, not the inside and the behavioral criteria. And people with autism, obviously, as all of us, are more than what you can see in their behavior. So understanding the inside of autism is actually a form of theory of mind, as Damien uh, talked about it yesterday, from the non-autistic brain towards the autistic brain. And an autism-friendly approach starts from understanding the way people with autism understand and perceive the world around them. So that's very crucial, and that's, according to, to our philosophy at Autism Central, the key uh, to autism friendliness. Now, the second thing is that uh, if I look at the criteria that are being used in DSM-5, um, they mainly mention what is bothering the non-autistic people in autism. And I think we should focus in the future more on what's bothering the people with autism. Mm -hmm. um, look at it again, the social and communication problems, I'm not saying that there are no people with autism who don't suffer themselves from the issues there, but you know what, a lack of reciprocity is only a problem when you're with more than one. Mm -hmm. um, and a lack of flexibility is only a problem when the people around you want, want you to be flexible. If you can follow your own routines, there's nothing wrong with a lack of flexibility. Mm -hmm. So, probably, the criteria that we use is what non-autistics find difficult about autism rather than what people with autism themselves struggle with. Why did it take us so long to put the sensory issues in there? Because that's something that is more often a problem for people with autism less than for the environment. 
A third thing is that I think, okay, in order to understand autism, we have focused a lot on the differences between neurotypicals and people with autism. But I think it's come, it has become time now to look at the similarities <laughs> rather than the differences. Um, I blame myself because I once wrote a book on psychoeducation which was called I'm Special, hmm? introducing people with autism to their diagnosis and saying that they were special. I think I should uh, revise that book and give it another title, I'm not so special. <laughs> because uh, I think people with autism are people in the first place and we should l take more time looking into the similarities and one of the similarities, and it's a main area, is the needs. Um, I've met many people with autism in my career, and I must admit, they have the same needs that all human beings have. The pyramid of needs, the basic needs like food, sex, water, sleep, and they are the same, and even all the needs uh, way up in the pyramid, I've seen them in people with autism, so I think we need to focus on the um, needs more than the deficits. And if we do, hmm, we should, not forget that there's not only deficits and difficulties, we need to take them seriously, but there are also strengths, possibilities, and values. Now, the, the move forward has to do a lot with our ideas about um, disability. And, and, you know, people are trying a lot to give a more positive, to reach a more positive approach. But one of the things that I don't mean today is that we should um, continue <coughs> what uh, Silverman has named in, in, in his blog for the BBC, the hipster parlor game of remotely diagnosing famous geeks and scientists such as Mozart had autism and Einstein had autism. Uh, Bill Gates, by the way, has autism. I think, well, I don't like these things because I like what Luke Jackson said, and he has been presenting for research autism as well. He said, you know, all these television programs about these geniuses, they are very depressing because I got all the nerdiness and the freakishness, but none of the genius. <laughs> Uh, and I think most of us are not a genius, let's be honest. And there's nothing wrong with that, because that, that does not mean that we do not have talents. I think we should stop putting uh, undue pressure on children with autism, because some of them grow up with the idea, I have to become Bill Gates or Einstein, and if not, I've failed in my life. So we need to take that undue pressure away, because as Lorna Wynn said in the second edition, you know what? Autism is not such a nice thing. We have to accept the facts, but only when we accept the facts in autism, we um, are more open for a positive idea in the future. So a positive approach does not mean romanticizing autism. It means that we focus on solutions and not only on the problems. It means we focus on strengths and not only on the deficits. It means we focus on well-being and not only the lack of it. And we focus on what people with autism need to flourish. Um, now, as I said, it has to do with our model of disability. There's two extremes. One is known as the medical model of disability, and that's what Autism Speaks, for instance, stands for in the United States. And they say autism is a disability because there is a disorder. So the problem is up there. It's, it's not very clear, but the problem is up there. It's, it's the pain that is squared and society demands people to be right. Mm. And what do you do with people who don't fit in? Mm. Early interventions, behavioral programs, which means trying to make a, a squared peg fit into a round hole. Well, you can do that, but the only result is that you will damage the peg. Mm. Um, that's one extreme. <coughs> the other extreme is uh, what I often see in autistic right movement saying, there's nothing wrong with us, it's society. Um, in other words, we are not having a disability, we are different, neurodiversity, we have a disability, and the problem is not us, the problem is society, because they expect us to be right. So, it's easy, what is the solution here? Make the whole square. Now, I think both models, I don't like both models, because they are too linear and they are not uh, nuanced enough. Um, for one thing, um, yeah, you can say that if you are so-called high-functioning or if you have high abilities. Yeah? But as Lorna said, thinking of her own daughter Susie, um, well, if I look at Susie, this is certainly a disability. Yeah? Um, so, they are linear models, and what they do is they try to look for a cause for the disability between brackets. They try to blame 
someone. And the medical model blames the person with autism, especially the brain and the genes. But in the social model, they blame society. So again, they look at differences, not similarities, and it leads to us versus them. People with autism versus the neurotypicals versus society. And it's too black and white, I think. Um, you know, um, quoting Oh Now Wing again, nature never draws a line without smudging it, and that is also true for the concept of disability. Disability is not a black and white thing. So I think it's, it's not useless to start discussing is autism a disability or not, uh, because I remember uh, an anecdote, one of the adults that I work with, he, at a given moment he told me, Peter, I'm not always autistic. And I thought, well, th that's strange, because it's something in your brain that we can't cure, so I think if you have an autistic brain, you have that brain for 24 hours a day, 7 hours 7. So I asked him, tell me, when are you not autistic? And he said, when I'm asleep. <laughs> and I must admit, I've seen him sleeping. And I thought, that would be a difficult time to diagnose autism in this <laughs> um, So then I asked him, can you give me another example? And he said, yes, I'm not autistic on these courses here, the activities that we at Autism Central organize. And I must admit, this is the nicest compliment I ever got. Because what he was saying, and I can tell you, he was very autistic in his behavior, but what he was saying is, I feel comfortable here. And that's the point. Which means, okay, um, I'm not interested in whether autism is a disability or not. I'm interested in when and where does the person have a disability. And a disability means I have frontiers, I have obstacles on my way to do things that everybody does in life and that I want to do as well. So therefore, rather than the medical model and, and, and the social model, I prefer what is called the citizenship model, which means we regard people with autism or people with any other disorders, disability, disability, and so on, as citizens in the first place. Citizens who need to have the freedom to do what they want with their life. Who have rights, rights to have access to everything in society that all people want to have access to. Education, public transportation, culture, you know, uh, we are the only organization I think in Europe that offers social cultural activities for people with autism in an autism friendly way because many of them now we start doing it here as well the special theater uh, autism friendly theater uh, events and so on but we have been doing that for more than 20 years but also not just the rights people with autism, uh, with autism also have duties and i will come back to that but how do we find a good citizen and how successful are people with autism as citizens well, the answer to that question can be found in what is called outcome studies. And there has now been a lot of outcome studies, and there's even now review studies, which means that studies summarizing what the studies have said about the outcome. Now, the outcome is not very positive if you read the summaries, but I ask myself, what are the criteria we use to define whether a person with autism is successful in life? Well, first of all, we look at employment. Because as society, we prefer to have citizens who have a job. Because then they pay taxes. And if you're unemployed, we don't value that as much. Oh, sorry, I'm too fast. We, we value people who have a lot of friends more than people who say, I'm single. I don't have any friends. We prefer to have citizens that are healthy. Again, because sick people cost us a lot of money. We prefer people who have high IQs. I think we have a more positive attitude towards autism, but I will only be happy when we have an equally positive attitude towards people with severe intellectual disabilities. Because nowadays you can say you have autism, but saying you have a low IQ, that's not very sexy. So we prefer people with high IQs. We prefer people who are independent. Well, I know nowadays, even with my children, when they are 25, 26, they still prefer to stay at Hotel Mama. Um, but if you're 45 and they ask you, where do you live? And you say, I still live with my parents. Mm -hmm. You won't get a lot of status. And the last thing is we measure autism symptoms. In many programs, to see, to, to get evidence based, to see whether they are successful, they, put, they look at scores on an ADOS. And if the scores are better after the intervention, it's a good intervention. Well, you know, I have some problems with these criteria. Because these are the objective ones. 
And I'm going to show you with two examples. On the left you see Peter, not me, but Peter is the man um, in, in the second from right, waving. Um, in his group home, Peter is living in a group home, which means low score for outcome. Um, he is not independent at all, because he needs support and help for getting dressed, for, for cooking, for his meals. So, again, low score for outcome. Um, does Peter have friends? Yes. If you ask him if he has friends, he says yes, and then he starts naming all the staff members, which we do not consider as real friends. They are his staff members. Um, he has no job. He goes to daycare center. Again, low score for outcome. Um, but Peter loves his staff members because they take into account his wishes, his needs. For instance, he loves swimming, so they take him to a swimming pool three times a week, which he loves to do. He loves music, so every day there is a musical activity, which one you see here, waving on some French song. Um, he loves to do that. They make sure he has his uh, pre pre most preferred spread on his sandwiches in the morning. So, actually, Peter is happy. But, according to the official academic criteria, he has a poor outcome. Now, on the right you see Mark, well, not Mark, his apartment. He has a job, well, he, he, he has a high IQ. He got a degree in law at university, but he's um, stacking uh, products on shelves in a supermarket, which he is saying, that's way below my level. And I have a university degree. This is something that Polish and Romanian immigrants should do, he says. Not me with my university degree. Um, he lives on his own, has his own flat, so he's independent, high score again on our uh, can cook his own meal, well, can cook his own meal, as you see he goes to fast food uh, restaurants and buys some fast food. Um, he has friends, many of them, uh, mainly on Minecraft and World of Warcraft. Uh, sometimes friends came to his apartment, but now there's no place to sit anymore, because it smells, it stinks. Um, but he's independent, has a job, high IQ, university degree, he has a good outcome. But he's unhappy. Now, if I ask you which one of those two lives would you choose if you had to switch, I knew which one I would choose. I would like to be Peter. Although he's so called low functioning and not dependent, but he's happy. Which means objective criteria don't say that. Don't say much about quality of life. And you don't have to believe me. He's not there today, I think, but Christopher did some research many years ago into a group of 120 uh, adults with autism and using the standard criteria for defining an outcome in autism, about 86% even more had a very poor to poor outcome, which means um, that's not good, that's not a good life. But a couple of years ago, uh, Christopher, together with his, with his uh, staff, uh, kind of uh, looked into the same group, the same group of 120 people, many of them have also additional learning difficulties and are living in group homes, therefore the low outcome, and this time he looked at uh, well-being and asked both staff members and parents how well, how is the well-being of your son, uh, how is the well-being of the clients, and also looked at the autism friendliness of the environment, and the results are completely the opposite, because 91% of them had a very high residential well-being, which means um, well, maybe we need to focus more on well-being. And now that's not new, the idea of well-being and quality of life. There are smart people like uh, Robert Shallock uh, who have defined what it is. And I will focus mainly on, on the last part, well-being there. You know, there's three areas of well-being. The physical one, hmm, being healthy. The material one, being rich. Uh, uh, and the emotional one, being happy. Um, of course, they are interrelated. Yeah? Um, if you have a good income, probably you can um, buy better food than if you are poor, which means that it's going to have an impact on, on your um, health as well. It's all about sleep and exercise. Now, we do know, and this study was already shown yesterday uh, by, by Digby, um, that uh, there are studies now on quality of life in adults with autism, and they show that people with autism experience a much lower quality of life compared to people without autism. So we see on, on these three areas a lot of issues. Um, such as sleeping problems. Um, I won't go into anxiety and stress because Damien already mentioned that yesterday, how, how important these issues are for people with autism. But even on, on the level of health, you know, we do know that uh, school-aged children with autism spectrum disorders are less fit as well, and that has an impact on your well-being. So there's all these comorbid disorders such as anxiety and stress, 
who have been well documented. And we do know there's a highly increased risk for mental health problems in Poles. And therefore, there's a lot of interest there. Um, a lot of tools and questionnaires are being developed. Questionnaires such as a stress service schedule, questionnaires uh, assessing anxiety in people with autism and learning difficulties, and so on. We put a lot, a lot, a lot of effort in there. Um, just to prove you, we, we have workshops at the Autism Central, and the most popular workshop, it's a two day workshop, is our stress management workshop. It's a two day, it, it's always fully booked the moment we put it online. Hmm? Um, it's a two-day workshop where people fill in a stress questionnaire that I developed uh, to, to assess stress experiences in people with autism and then try to develop stress management. Uh, but I think we focus on these problems. What if we would take a U-turn and stop focusing on the problems hmm? um, and focusing more on happiness rather than, than the lack of happiness? Because if I look at the literature and the research, the way we define well-being for people with autism right now is a rather negative <coughs> definition. We are satisfied when there is no mental health issues. That's kind of a negative definition of mental health. As long as there are no problems or issues, then we are satisfied. I think we should not be satisfied. Now, if I ask people, try to visualize happiness, we don't have time here within a workshop, then I ask people to take a pen and a paper and make a drawing of what for you is the ultimate idea of, wow, being happy and satisfied. And most people draw something like that. You know, and that's what most people think that happiness is. While in reality, it's more this. <laughs> <laughs> Which means we need to be realistic about happiness. It's about, let's say, a good balance between negative and positive feelings. And if you have more negative feelings, then you're not so very happy. Now, I think when it's uh, the traditional approach I see right now is okay, people with autism have more negative feelings, stress, anxiety. We should make sure there's a balance between the two. And I'm not satisfied with that one. I think we should strive at this that people with autism have much more positive feelings than negative feelings. And why should we do so? I have two reasons. One reason is that we know that people with an autistic brain are more vulnerable to negative life events. Yeah? Um, you should have listened to Dane yesterday. Yeah. Um, which means if something negative happens, a negative life event, uh, it showed you the lightning, then it means if you're only in balance, you get um, a very negative feeling. So if we make sure there are more positive feelings, we will make people with also more resilient. So the first reason is resilience. The second reason is, just as there is often a vicious circle of people getting depressed and it gets worse and worse and worse, there's also a virtuous circle. There's research showing that if you can trigger positive emotions, then they trigger an upward spiral, a virtuous circle, towards more emotional well-being. Because there is a link between negative feelings and detail focus and rigidity and thinking. People who don't feel well emotionally have the tendency to focus on irrelevant details, to get worried about little things, and they are often rigid. They don't want to change very easily. Now, I put them in green because I know those two things. It's something they say that is typical for people with autism. Positive feelings, on the other hand, increase your cognitive function, your flexibility and adaptability. In other words, the default paradigm is this one. If we could make people with autism less autistic, then they will be happier. I think it's the other way around. If you want to do something about autistic symptoms, make sure they feel better. I can guarantee you, when, when I do my activities with my adults, um, and we have two or three day course in the evening, the bar is open, they are adults, so they are invited to go to a bar, huh? and some of them drink beer, and most of you know our beer in Belgium is real beer, not the <laughs> um, Which means more alcohol, and I can assure you, people with autism have had one or two trappists, well, they are very, very social. Hmm? You don't see any social interaction problems anymore. Now, what I'm not saying is that you should be alcoholics anymore. What I do say is, what happens when you drink alcohol? You feel more relaxed. And being more relaxed makes you more open towards the world and the people around you. They are better communicators as well. And suddenly they start telling jokes. 
Don't have a say again that people with autism don't have humor. Okay, um, I think I have 15 more minutes left, something like that. Well, I have about 400 slides to go, that should work. Um, in brief, five strategies that I think we should adopt. Um, try to figure out what well-being means for them, be autism friendly, balance between support and challenge, work on a positive self-esteem and put happiness as a core. Okay, first of all, find out what makes people with autism happy. And that means stop projecting your neurotypical ideas about happiness onto people with autism. I remember this boy who was standing all alone in the corner of the playground, and then the teacher said, oh, poor little thing. You know what, we're gonna make a social story for him, explaining how he can join in with the other kids. So they made this nice social story, and he said, why do I have to do that? Well, then you can play with the other kids. And he said, I don't wanna play with the other kids. I'm perfectly well here. I, I'd like to, I love to watch other kids playing, but I don't want to join in. Moreover, if I'm standing here in the corner, nobody can suddenly approach me from the back and touch me. So I feel safe. Hmm? So, well, let him stand there. Who are we to decide this? Oh, poor little thing. He's happy there. Okay. Um, which means we should develop tools to assess well-being. <laughs> Again, for my two-day workshop on stress, I, I had this autism stress inventory that I developed. It's very popular in Belgium and the Netherlands. Yeah? It's used all over. Um, and the only effect is that, well, there's two effects. Um, one is that it doesn't tell us what we should do to make people with autism feel happier. The second thing, uh, I fill in the questionnaire with the participants in my workshop the first day, and by the end of the first day, all of them are severely clinically depressed. Because, oh, Jesus. They have all sensory stuff, all social things, that's also bad. So I thought, no, 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 we should not do that. We should use um, assessments for quality of life and, and well-being. And they do exist. This is the one that is being used or developed by the World Health Organization. The problem is they are not autism friendly. Mm -hmm. I have felt cheerful and in good spirits is the first question. What does that actually mean? Well, it probably means this, being in good spirits. <laughs> it also asks you, I woke up feeling fresh. What kind of body temperature is there? Is um, this is another one. Hmm? In most ways, my life is close to my ideal. This is a very awesome, unfriendly question, because it has these vague words like most and close to. Or, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. I know people who don't say, I don't believe in reincarnation. <laughs> and I would change almost nothing. So is that one thing or two things? <laughs> yeah. So I think we need to develop, and I'm very proud to say that I developed, I, I, I revised my stress questionnaire into an autism good feeling questionnaire. It has been translated in Danish and English, and it's being tested and assessed now uh, in Scotland, where people try to find out whether uh, you can work with this. But we also have for people with autism and learning difficulties develop all kinds of activities to assess, for instance, rather than looking to sensory issues, we ask them, what of the sensory stimulation do you like, rather than what is bothering you? Okay. Um, autistic thinking. You know, when it comes to wellness nowadays, wellness, we all have to do wellness nowadays. Yeah? Um, and then uh, we go to light therapy, and psychotherapy, uh, CBT for people with autism, relaxation, mindfulness, very popular. So we all have to buy raisins and look at uh, raisins to, to feel better. You know, all these things are not bad. Mm, they do work, but the thing is they won't work if the basic needs are not met. Remember the pyramid of Maslow. If you look at emotional well-being, the way it's defined, the basic needs for people with autism, and they are not different from people without autism, again, similarities are safety and freedom from stress. So I think, yeah, you can use mindfulness to make people with autism feel better, but the first thing is to make sure they have a predictable environment. So autism friendliness is 90% clarity and predictability, and 10% normal friendliness. And once you have guaranteed that one, and that's not easy, then you can go to your mindfulness. So predictability comes first, all the rest comes later. Strategy number three, I can only just be very brief about all of them. I could talk all day, well, as a matter of fact, there's something of autism in all of us. I could talk four days or five days about this. Uh, <laughs> proper balance. We did a research in Belgium. Um, this guy, Professor Ruiers, psychologist, um, and they were looking 
into quality of life of so-called high-functioning, I hate the term, adults with autism. And, and remarkably, they found no correlation between quality of life and IQ, severity of autism, and the amount of support, whether it be formal or informal. Formal means support by, by people who are being paid to offer the support. Informal is support by your parents, your relatives, your friends, your neighbors, and so on. Only the perception of support was important, which means more support is not necessarily better. I think the authorities would like to hear this. <laughs> it's no excuse not to put more means in this. But it's saying only the support of the person with autism means. And it also means we have to find a balance between the challenges and the protection. What I see nowadays is sometimes we're into overprotecting people with autism, giving them the support they don't need, or taking away responsibility for people. Can they? Can people with autism? And they have responsibility for something? Of course they can be responsible for something. What I see in group homes, for instance, one group home where they make nice things, and then they sell them in their shop, and then they said, we won't put people with autism in the shop. And I said, why not? <coughs> well, then you're responsible for money, for social interaction with clients. So, would you like to do a job and you don't know what happens with the results of your job? People with autism want to see the effect. They should be in the shop. Yeah, but we can't make them responsible. Autism and responsibility said, I've never read that people with autism cannot be responsible. So, on the other hand, people with autism sometimes use their autism as well to say, I can't do that, <coughs> as an excuse. I can't cue because I have autism. And I think, no, you know what? I learned a lot from, from, from um, people with autism like Ross Blackburn and Temple Brandon, who said, we've got that far in our life in independence and responsibility because oh, we never used autism as an alibi and our parents never let us use autism as an alibi. In, in this book that I can recommend, Scholars with Autism, uh, in there, uh, Temple Brandon in, in her chapter says, my mother had high expectations for my baby. Sometimes I see, oh, he has autism, or oh, poor, okay, let's dim the lights, let's not clap our hands, and so on, because they have autism. They can't stand that. But some of people with autism obviously have sensory difficulties with that. But there are people with autism who can cope with that. So let's not think black and white. Let's start from my expectations and push them, but together with high support. Because let's not forget, happiness is not the absence of problems. Absence is, uh, happiness is the ability to cope with them, which means sometimes you need to challenge a person with autism so that they can develop coping strategies. So we should not avoid the challenges, but we should support people with autism to face the challenges of life. Because to me, that, that is important for two reasons. One is, the more you take away the challenges and the more you take away responsibility, you will create something that is well known among psychologists as learned helplessness. And the second reason is, if you say people with autism cannot cue, they cannot do this, they cannot stand that, then, then you don't believe in, this, in their strengths. Hmm? Again, we need to take into account the difficulties, but we also should believe in the strengths. And then two more strategies, and I will end in time. Work on a positive self-esteem. Now, what happens in, I don't know how it is here, but what happens in Belgium and the Netherlands if you have a low self-esteem, if you say, I can't do nothing, I'm stupid, and, and so on, they send you to a psychologist. You have to go into psychoeducation, psychotherapy, uh, whatever. And what happens there is a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a counselor who tells you, yeah, okay, but you're okay. You're okay. Blah, blah, blah. All the time talking. Look at your positive aspects as well. Look at your strengths. Now, what would, how much would you believe that counselor or psychologist if your whole life is one big failure? Hmm? Your mind broken down and your wife said impossible to live with you you lose your job your kids tell you you're you're the most horrible parent in the world there is hmm? in your hobby club they kicked you out because oh Jesus we can't bear you anymore you know everything you try in life is a failure and then you come to me famous psychologist from Belgium and I tell you in 15 minutes every week but you're okay <laughs> So I think we need to make sure, rather than paying lip service to strengths and qualities of people with autism and saying they are okay, they have qualities, 
rather than getting Bill Gates out of the closet, we should make sure that people with autism see and experience that they can contribute as citizens should do to society. Again, the default idea is first they need to have the communication and the social skills and they need to feel well before we can put them into a job. I think it's the opposite way. Um, if you have a job where you are valued for what you do, it will increase your quality of life. Moreover, it's the same is true for social skills training. You don't need to have social skills training before you start the job. Where did most of you learn the social skills necessary for your job? Not at school. On the job. Of course, people with autism need some special support there, but they acquire the social skills on the job. So, and we do know that employment indeed is, is extremely necessary. I'm going to say something very blunt now. But I think that every person with autism should have a job. They all should work. And there's two reasons why I say so. The first reason is I still hope to go on retirement within some years. So I want enough people out there having a job to pay taxes so I get my pension. That's the first reason. I want people with autism to pay for my pension. Um, but the main reason is that I'm convinced that every person with autism can have a job. Mm -hmm. um, and then you say, yeah, but then you're only talking again about the more able ones, the people with autism who have high IQs. No, I think we're not creative enough in our society when thinking about job and employment and work. But every person with autism can contribute to society. And I'm convinced about that. And let me tell you a story to end with a short story. Um, which is one that, that is for us, for me, being very, very inspirational. Um, a boy with autism, non-verbal, so probably you would call him low functioning, who had this obsession for the sound of breaking glass. And I'm not talking about the song here. I'm talking really about, oh, he would, he would love to come in here and the, the room next door would even be nice because if you would see a glass, he smashes it on the floor. Unfortunately, there's carpet here, so they don't have a good effect. But he loves to smash glasses, and then he flaps. That's the sensory thing he wants. Now, everybody considers that as challenging behavior. Hmm? So what do we do? Avoidance. We try to avoid that he see glassware. So whenever you go somewhere with him, the staff member say, first someone checks if there are no, if there are no bottles or glasses. Hmm? Uh, parents. When they visit uh, the grandparents or relatives, they make a phone call first. We're coming, hmm, with, uh, let's call him Peter. And then grandma says, OK, I have to hide my glassware now. Uh, no, I can assure you, the more you hide glasses and glassware for Peter, the more he will become specialized in spotting glassware from five miles distance. <laughs> That's what happens with people with autism. They are systemizers. They have a good eye for details. So they spot a glass over there. And he's quick. It's not because he has an intellectual disability that his legs don't work. So he's there before you are there and smashing the glass. So but what if we take a more positive approach and think, OK, he has a talent for breaking glass. Where can we use it? Where do you break glass? Don't know if you have them here. But in Belgium and the Netherlands, we have these recycling balls in every borough, in every corner almost. And there you have to go there with your bottles and throw them in to be recycled. And that's what we told them to do. Of course, that does not mean you give Peter a bottle, because the first thing he will do when he gets a bottle is, whoops, it goes back. So in the beginning, we went with him to the, the, the recycling ball, and then only got out the bottle to get physical help, put it in there. And you know what? He jumped even higher than before because breaking a glass makes an even nicer sound. Now the problem was his parents were not alcoholics, so they only had two bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do then? We asked the neighbors, don't you have any empty bottles left? Now I'm gonna make a long story short because it took us more than two years. But right now, Peter, when he comes home, he has this little how do you call it in English? Trolley. Yeah, trolley. And he does the tour in the neighborhood, collects bottles and brings them to the recycling. So he's responsible of the neighborhood for recycling glass. 
Okay, now and then he makes a little mistake and still <laughs> smashes the bottle. But okay, don't you ever make mistakes? Huh? Suddenly when you have autism you can't make mistakes anymore. Huh? And so it's part of the learning curve. Now this is proof that everybody can contribute. Because Peter, the boy that was the one, oh Jesus, there's Peter, hi you boss, man, <laughs> is now, oh there's Peter, he's the one who is responsible in the neighborhood for the recycling of glass. And Peter is not the highest functioning person in autism. Okay, so put this in your treatment plans. Huh? Using even so-called challenging behaviors as something that can be changed into a contribution to society. And remember, there is no link between severity of autism and quality of life. Which means we should stop aiming with our interventions at decreasing the so-called degrees of autism. Hmm? I read a lot of these scientific articles saying uh, now we have evidence for the effects of our program because we did the ADOS before, ADOS before, and we did it afterward, and the scores are better. And I think, okay, you, you, you made him less autistic, but is he happier now? Hmm? That's the question. Again, do not forget, eh? there is no link, and that's what the review study that was shown yesterday by Digby as well. Age, IQ, and symptom severity do not predict quality of life in autism. Hmm? Which means, we have to rethink our goals. Do we want to increase their IQs? Will that make them happier? Do we want to lower scores on autism measurements? Do we want to normalize people with them? Or do we want them to be as happy as possible as Lorna Wing said? Okay. So, in order to do that, focus on what they can do. And we don't do that yet enough. Because, and I will end here, if you look at, at this is a study published, um, I think two years ago, a summary of uh, all the evidence-based practices for children, youth, and young adults with an autism spectrum disorder. And uh, I was not interested in how evidence-based are certain strategies. I was interested in what do they use these interventions and these practices for. And it's no uh, surprise that if you look, maybe it's too small to read in the back, but you have television screens, that the two areas most addressed in interventions are the communication and the social areas, because those are the criteria for autism. Almost 40% of the strategies developed are uh, aiming at increasing the communication abilities and the social skills of people with autism. And again, in itself, there's nothing wrong with that. But I was, I think it's appalling that if you look at it, that only one study out of 456 aimed at increasing the emotional well-being of children with autism. Only one out of 456. That's not barely 0.2%. I, I would like to see that number raised. I'm not saying we should not do any social skills training anymore and uh, teaching communication abilities, but I think we should have a better balance. Because the goal is not to make people with autism less autistic, but to make them autistically happy. Thank you very much. You can do this in Belgium. Come on. <laughs>